Things we only allow men and women in the MNF on our passports. And that was pretty much the only explanation. I contacted uh, the Southern Law Poverty Center, the Transgender Law Center, the, the trans, uh, I can't remember the, the initials, um, Mark Hensley organization, I can't remember what it is, but they do some policy anyway. And Lambda Legal. Uh, Southern Paul Lowry Center turned me down, ACL, you turned me down, uh, Transgender uh, Law Center, uh, we talked for a little bit, uh, and they finally said, no, Lambda Legal uh, said, hey, let's talk. Uh, so I met uh, one of their attorneys, a great guy named Drew Esmer, at uh, Creating Change in Denver. I had plans to see a bunch of different things at Creating Change. I didn't see any of those. Paul and I talked for four days. Uh, it was a great, great time. Uh, I was excited. And then I got contacted by uh, uh, my lead attorney, Paul, who, you know, well, basically said, well, we're taking your case. Uh, let's get this stuff going. And Lambda Legal have been taking me step by step uh, the whole the rest of the time. I mean, both Paul and Drew, you know, I think both asked me if I was, had studied law or anything like that. Basically, all I did was say I studied the Constitution and a few other law books uh, and studied them hard and some of the case stuff, but no, I'm not an attorney. <laughs> uh, I just uh, try to dot all my I's and cross all my T's and figure out what I needed to do and study those aspects. I'm going to turn this over a little bit and, uh, and go from there. Okay, thanks, Dana. So I'm one of Dana's lawyers, one of the attorney team at Lambda Legal, and I am honored to be so. And I consider this case extremely significant to the work that you're doing, and am proud to work with Dana. Lambda Legal is the oldest and largest national legal organization dedicated to the rights of LGBT people, sex people, people living with HIV, basically movement lawyers looking for justice and equality throughout the United States. And that is our mission. Um, we also incubated a national legal project for intersex people for four years. And I was part of advising that and, and making sure that we could do the sponsorship that allowed that nonprofit to be born and grow. So we go way back um, many years in our concern over the rights of intersex people. And, and this, is, this case is the continuing step in, in trying to make equality and justice a reality for people, regardless of their gender identity. And core to this case is to understand that when we say people's gender identity or their sex, that in this world, the reality is that that doesn't mean only male or only female, that there is more of a spectrum, there are more options, there are more truths. Um, for many people, the ballpark estimates of intersex births, people who were born with intersex traits or conditions in this country is approximately one in 2,000. That is not so rare. We're a big country, there are lots of people. A significant number of people um, intersex people, and, and there are other people, um, and I think that this room probably is pretty aware of that, who don't fall on a binary, and that we want there to be justice, recognition, and for people to be able to live their lives truly and recognize for who they are without being constrained by their gender, by their sexual orientation, by their gender identity. And so to me, that's sort of the big rubric for what Lambda Legal is fighting for. That's where pretty much everything really fits in. And that's why all of this alignment works and why we would do this case and others like it and um, think it's extremely important that we do it. Um, and I, I want to sort of you know, tip my hat to Dana because I, I really think it takes a lot for any of our plaintiffs to do this work. 
and I have never worked with a plaintiff who doesn't say, I want this to be right for me, yes, but I, I'm also doing this because I don't want this to happen to anybody else. Other people should be able to live their lives without this kind of discrimination, so I stand for that for myself, but I also stand for it for the community. And so, I guess the question, you know, either Dana's on the shoulders of a lot of people, or there are a heck of a lot of people on Dana's shoulders right now. And, and so I am pleased that we can work in partnership. I'm also, I'm glad to hear that part of the sponsorship for this forum is Columbia students who are interested in reproductive justice. And when Liz asked that I talk about some of the sort of legal bases, I think that you can see clear um, alignment and the reason that we would be connecting not only to LGBT rights cases that talk about, uh, you know, whether it's our marriage case or Lawrence versus Texas that Land the Legal won in 2003 <coughs> that, um, that decriminalized the identities of uh, um, people based on their sexual orientation, that all of these things that, that free people from discrimination that's baseless, this is all, this is all um, a core to what we're doing. And in addition to those LGBT rights cases, we rely on and are very synchronized with the reproductive rights cases about personal autonomy, decision making, and the space into which the government should not be able to go. The space where it's about our decision making and our identities and our choices and our realities, and that the government should not have free reign to interfere um, if they're going to interfere, there should be a very high standard. It, there should be um, a level of justification that would warrant either strict scrutiny and meet strict scrutiny, if we're talking about a fundamental right here, and I'll talk about some of those rights implicated in Dana's Dana case, um, or at least heightened scrutiny for discrimination based on sex. And again, we're looking at this, and I think we're leading edge here, not just in terms of discrimination based on your male and your female, discrimination based on your sex, based on your gender identity, and that is not exclusive to male and female. And for many, though not all, but for many intersex people, including Dana, that means I'm not gonna check the box M, I'm not gonna check the box F, neither is, is accurate. And PS, when you apply for a passport, which the government calls its signature premier identity document in the US, and this is in the legal papers responding to us, under penalty of, of criminal, uh, you know, pursuit of violating the law, you are required, of course, to answer truthfully. So Dana cannot answer truthfully, and it would ac actually threaten criminal penalties against Dana to check either the M or the F, and they're not given the option to truly reflect their identity in what is called this premier identity document of the country. And I see Liz asking a question. Um, yeah, one of the I'd like to sort of prompt some discussion and how Intersex Day of Awareness was founded. And it was initially through some activism that happened outside an American Society of Pediatrics meeting about um, surgeries and medical treat treatments being brought on uh, youths, infants, uh, people that didn't have a say in their medical care or legally didn't have autonomy over their bodies. Um, what are the sort of movements both on the activist side and on the legal side to protect the rights of uh, intersex persons at birth and um, through childhood when um, you know it's most important that they have people speaking for them so they can, um, speak for themselves. What is the what are the best practices for advocacy? What do you both see as the means moving forward both in the on the activist side and on the legal side? Um. Well, today is the, the 20th anniversary, I believe, of Intersex Day of Awareness. Um, and that was the Hermaphrodites of Attitude, I believe, did the first protest uh, 20 years ago. Um, I wasn't there. I didn't know I was intersex until like 2007. So, but uh, on, on the side of uh, uh, children, one of the things that happens to us, uh, all intersect, pretty much all, I, I, I don't know of any exceptions to this, is that we're all forced into the binary system of your male or female, um, even though we're intersect. Uh, therefore, 
uh, through cultural society, our parents, and what the doctors tell us how to raise us. The other thing that may happen to us is, is the medical side where we're, our bodies are forcibly changed through either hormones or, or, or some other chemical means or, and or I should say surgical means on top of the cultural portion of the binary. And that causes a, something most people never even consider is the mental health side, which screws us up for life. I, I still suffer from, from those things. I still suffer from the physical side of those things. For those who want to get more of that, I mean, I have stuff on the back side of my card, the uh, things I still suffer from. Um, so those still exist for each and every one of us, uh, at least on the mental health side. It changes our bodies if you're getting hormones or testosterone or steroids. It changes our body physically. 